I mean, I love the diversity of it. I love the gelati aspect of it. I love, you know, working back in a hotel with um, with a team of the, with the team there, and then even the restaurants. I just think it's kind of, yeah, it keeps me busy, and I kind of like just just like the the variety. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The melting pot of cultures down under has created the most incredible restaurant industry. It's created subcultures dedicated to different cuisines where communities come together to celebrate their heritage and new home too. It's also seen many mixed families where different cultures combine in one household to deliver incredible food experiences for those growing up. Adam De Silva is the executive chef and co-owner of Coda and Tonka, owner of Boca Gelato and the culinary director of the W in Melbourne. Adam, you're pretty busy. Uh, just a bit, just a bit. <laughs> Adam, you grew up in an Indian-Italian household. What was food like for you growing up? Um, it was very interesting. I mean, interesting now you look at it, but it was the norm, the norm was a bowl of pasta and a, a, a bowl of curry and a bowl of rice on the table because my, wow. my, father, my father's Anglo-Indian, um, born from uh, Chennai, migrated. I mean, he's about 20. And my mum is from um, Abruzzo, from Salmona, in Italy, and migrated when she was about 10. So, you know, first, I'm first generation uh, Australian and uh, Melbourne born and bred. Wow. It would take us back to when you were young. Is there any sort of feasts or influences uh, when you were a kid that you can tell us about? Oh, 100%. I mean, I grew up in a butcher shop. Uh, father was a butcher, so since I was born. Uh, and then also the other extended family were into, like, the wine industry. And um, I grew up most, I was mainly, um, you know, minded by my nonna, who had a, who, you know, whose house was pretty much, a farm, its own ecosystem. Wow! You know, like all, all all vegetables growing, chickens, every fruit tree you can think of, from figs to grapes to you know locusts, to and then making salami, making your own wine. So pretty much, wow. yeah, making everything. So that was just the norm growing up in you know, like a really you know bountiful backyard. When was the? When did you first realize that perhaps chefing was something that you might be interested in for a career? I realised when I was in my, oh, I would have been probably about maybe eight or nine. I kind of really loved cooking, and you know, one of the first dishes I learned how to make was um, gnocchi with my nonna when I was about three. I used to just always help her either knead the dough, she let us eat, you know, let us do that, and also you know, turning turning the pasta wheel because back then there wasn't wasn't anything motorised. So <laughs> that was that was that, that was our job. So just always brought about, brought, you know, always surrounded by food. I just kind of just, I love, I love, I love food, but I didn't really understand back then what it would be like to be a professional chef. Well, tell us about that, that first step into commercial cookery. What was it like during your apprenticeship compared to what you grew up with in the home? Uh, well, well, very different. When I started, I started, I was always working in the butcher shops, washing dishes on the weekends or even working, working every school holidays in the butcher shop because that's what you do. Um, and then going working for someone else, being a kitchen and in a restaurant called Fiorelli's in Camberwell, which is still around um, 27 years later. Wow. Um, and then making pizzas three nights a week during uh, my year 12 on a Friday, Saturday and Sunday nights. So that taught me um, how to do service, how to answer a phone, how to top pizzas, how to pull them <laughs> out of the oven <laughs> and, and work with a crazy a crazy Sicilian man uh, <laughs> who used to always send me up to the tab and collect his winnings and then he always used to just yell and yell, and yell abuse at his wife every time. So it was, it was quite... It was quite <laughs> anyway, yeah, but that was, that was, that was an amazing experience and... Uh, so then I just started my apprenticeship at the Hilton on the Park, um, which was a process back then to get to get an apprenticeship there. I had to do like almost like a like a foodie exam. Wow! So, you know the the exec chef back then was a was a hard ass uh, German called Werner Kimmeringer, and you gave he gave us he gave six apprentices a box of food, and we had to make a salad out of it. 
And uh, looking back at it, I was the only one that actually kept the salad within the rim of the plate. And uh, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a big career. <laughs> so then I, long story short, got the apprenticeship and started straight away after I finished my year 12. Wow. You've, you've done so many things since then. What's been the really integral moments uh, in your career in the early days? Um, there's a few pivotal moments. There was one where I, I was, you know, I was in my third, about to get hit my, hit my fourth year of apprenticeship at the Hilton. The current executive chef left to go work at another hotel. I went to go, he went to go with Carlton Crest. I wanted to go work at um, the Sheridan, Sheridan on the Park back then. Mm. Um, and long story short, because I didn't follow my executive chef, he gave me a bad rap. And this is after I just um, you know, won Apprentice of the Year at Box Hill TAFE also. So I wasn't, you know, the worst going around and uh, didn't get the job uh, at the hotel. And that's when I kind of just switched to restaurants. So that was a very wow. big moment where I never looked back at, you know, kind of, I guess, working in hotels. But now it's a full circle moment with uh, me working back in a hotel at the W. So. Restaurants have been a, a key feature of your career and you've got some of Melbourne's best restaurants now, but you explored sort of uh, Europe and Asia as a chef. Tell us about that period of time. Um, yeah, so I was at Cosy. I went, so I went going from just doing international food at the Hilton to doing Italian food at Cosy Restaurant in South Yarra, which was great. You know, I was young. I ended up heading up the kitchen at such a young age of like I think 22, 23, um, having a you know having a brigade probably didn't have the experience but knew kind of guess kind of how to get the, how to get the job done and so I did that for three years which was a great experience um, you know great time of life in the twenties also party at the same time as well as working hard as you did back in the late nineties and um, then I had the opportunity where my um, zio um, Mario just, um, sent me organised me to go cook in Italy to cook in Umbria wow. So, um, that was another pivotal moment because it was like uh, pretty much 12 months in Italy. I worked cooked in Umbria and then I went to just in a place called um, Perugia. Uh, sorry, Tojano, sorry. So I was, yeah. And then I ended up going back up north to a place just out of Ancona um, called Loretto. So in a little Italian village there, which, which I had mates that I'd worked with back at Cosi, um, they were from that area. So I went back and worked um, with them. How different was uh, cooking Italian food in Italy compared to what you had experienced in Australia? Oh, cooking Italian food in Italy was, you know, was what, what was in season is what you cooked with. You know, so when truffles are in season or tomatoes are in season, they're at their best where, you know, in Australia you could always get, you know, you can get tomatoes all year round and strawberries mm. all year round. But it was more the culture of it. You know, you'd work six days a week. You go to work, you do prep, you sit down and have a proper lunch. There's always wine on the table, so you'd have a few, few vinos before service. You do lunch, <laughs> and then you have you know pomeriggio they call it. So you'd either just go home and sleep, or I, I'd do it. I went and slept on the beach, and then um, wow. after after about six months of uh, eating and drinking, because then at, you know at five thirty you'd meet at the local cafe, you'd have an aperitif, go to work, do some prep, sit down, have dinner and then do service, and then you go out to a bar afterwards. So about after six months of doing that, I was like, you know what, I'm like, this is not good for me, this is not good for me. I got, got really, I got really fit and I started going to the gym, stopped drinking, and so just started going to the gym in the afternoon. And um, wow. yeah, just so did that. And then I came back to Australia. Uh, I went via London um, and I contemplated staying in London and, and, and working there. Mm. And but I just didn't really, you know, I kind of just missed my family and friends. You know, even my brother was my brother was in London at the time, but I was just like, you know, I think it's just time to come back, come back home to Australia. You know, the, the lifestyle is great, you know, in Italy, but you know, you can always, you know, with all my travels, I've always called Australia home or Melbourne home, and thought we've got the best standard of living um, anywhere. So I came back, and there was. I applied for a job with Greg Maloof and a job for Jeff Lindsay. Um, mm. Greg Maloof was a Momo's, um, which is now the, um, where Philip Michelle is. Uh, and then there was Jeff Lindsay was a Pearl restaurant. Um, I ended up taking the job with Jeff because uh, I thought I'd never, I never really did Asian food like he did it. Mm. And they really loved it and I loved the whole restaurant. And so – Ended up working for him there, but also loved um, Greg Maloof's food, that Middle Eastern. 
Um, and I think it was just also, ex- 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 um, you know, access to the city. It was just a lot of just, you know, using girls in Richmond. Seems pretty cool. Like the food. It was two-hat restaurant. Mm. Thought, you know, so I go with that one. And, uh, you know, fast forward, I ended up working there for seven years. Well, Pearl was a very influential restaurant in Melbourne's history. What was it like working with Jeff? And do you have any memories of that time? Yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, like he was, he's been a great mentor of mine. Um, and influenced the style of food that I that I cook now, and you know just the level the level of it, but also the creativityness of it. You know, we had some really great times, and yeah, it was really good. It was really good. And then during that time, I'm um, well, I was at Pearl. I met Marty Martin Boats from Long Grain. Mm. He, you know, Jeff would always get some um, chefs down from Sydney to come and do some guest chefs from like you know Matt Moran to Kylie Kwong to um, Stephen Snow to Marty Boats. So um, I ended up, you know, he'd always come and ask me to help out when he came down to Melbourne for cooking classes and stuff. And then they were uh, going to open, um, Mel- you know, Long Grain was going to come to Melbourne. And I do remember this, another pivotal moment uh, was I was out, I saw Marty out, we were having a chat and he said, okay, I'm coming to go to Long Grain Melbourne. Um, and I said, well, who's your head chef? He goes, oh, oh this guy, Luke. I said, well, I thought, I was going to say to him, I thought you'd make me, make me your head chef. <laughs> he goes, really? He goes, yeah, I thought I'd be your head chef. So uh, I was head chef currently at Pearl. And uh, so Marty the next day fired, fired, fired that head chef and uh, made me wow. the top of Long Grain Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and during that time, you know, I won that Lexus, Lexus Young Chef of the Year of Victoria twice with Luke Mangan's mm. now Appetite for Excellence, which was also a bit of a game changer, you know, um, you know helping build my profile. Um, so they pretty much lived in Sydney for six months, training and learning um, all of Long Grain's food, and then we opened up, you know, Melbourne Long Grain to you know big fanfare and was very popular. So well, that lasted about a year. Until well, tell us a bit there. about Melbourne Long Grain because it's such an institution, or was such an institution in Sydney. Um, what what sort of food were you cooking, and was there a lot of pressures for it to be successful given its status in Sydney? Oh, there was there was a huge um, expectation and anticipation of that's why you know of making sure you know did the food right, which we did, um, and everyone and, and Melbourne hadn't really experienced Thai food that way, so it was a great, great. I mean, it was a great um, you know experience, especially being in Sydney, then coming to do it in Melbourne, and it isn't was an institution because it was that I think also was another landscape of you know shared. Um, banquet style, you know, Asian food, you know, because it wasn't really happening in Melbourne back then. You know, we we're still mm. in fine dining. So, I guess it was when you when you kind of look at it. I guess it was one of the first uh, restaurants that did that shared style, you know, and, and you know the cocktail. So it was it was great. You know, it was really good. The food was great. It was hard work. You know, it was hard work opening um, a restaurant. You know, it was a, the the first six months was the hardest that I could have worked. I'd ever worked. And I always said to myself after that experience that the next time I'd open a restaurant, I'm going to do it for myself. Wow. Well, that that eventuated in 2009 and you opened Coda. Tell us how that came about. Well, that came about also while when I was at Long Grain, I um, ended up getting a phone call from Jeff because the, the year that I left in 2005, Pearl got awarded three chef's hats. So that was done under my, under my, under my you know, uh, leadership at Pearl, where we won three chefs hats, mm. which was amazing. And then, but I was at Long Grain, and then uh, about, about a year later, Jeff rings me and goes, "Mate, can you come back and um, be head chef again? Because uh, you know, there's a need you. Then there's the current head chefs left, and uh, you know." And I said, "No problem." Things kind of fizzled out with um at Long Grain there, and uh, went back to Pearl, and then within two years, uh, open Coda. Because sort of, I was just, I was just kind of waiting, waiting, waiting water, just for the right opportunity came along, which it did with my business partners Michael Bartholomew, um, his father got us together, Peter Bartholomew, um, who's also a bit of you know a bit of Movida and mm. other restaurants, um, Lee Hu Fook, um, and that's how it kind of came together. And I said I had the I had the idea of doing, um, you know. Pearl, pearly, pearly kind of long grainy food, but like as I said, like more of a Asian movita, you know, just keeping it really kind of cash, keeping it fun, 
um, shared style, and that's how the whole thing of Coda was based, you know, and having that kind of French, European, um, Asian blend of food. This episode is proudly supported by Montague, handpicked for you. The things that we're really looking for in plums, first of all, they've got to be sweet. We're really looking for a full flavour explosion um, in our plums. Red flesh is critically important to us, higher in antioxidants, so all that good stuff. And then we're also looking to add a slightly firmer texture, so there's a little, almost a little crunch. You know, that's a real driver for us. For more information, go to montague.com.au. What were the challenges in the early days of of creating your own restaurant that you hadn't been aware of previously? Uh, Well, we bought what was called Mini, which was the first, I guess, Hellenic-style restaurant in that Flinders Lane, and it was pretty much there was nothing there. Andrew McConnell just opened up Cumulus Mm. uh, about a, a year before and just opened up. So, And then George opened the Press Club about a year, a couple of, a year before that. So the challenges were, well, look, it was just organi- coming up with coming up with the menu and coming up with something that I think people would like to eat. So, which which we kind of, which I kind of did, um, and we just kind of went for it, you know. But there was no fear, I guess, because I'd say to Michael, my business partner, said, "Look, I know how to cook, so I'm not, I'm not scared, and you know how to obviously, um, you know, run 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 the front of house. So let's just do what we always did for other people and do it, and it." And it was a success. We hit the ground running. And um, once again, it was really hard the first six months, working every day pretty much, six days a week, making sure it all went well and all established and people liking what we were doing. Well, tell us about your cooking in those early years with Coda. Is there a dish or two that you can tell us about that really exemplifies what Coda was doing? Um, oh, look, there was the sugarcane prawns. Um, which I, you know, which we used to, you know, get fresh sugar cane, some wrap some prawn mousse around it, and I'd put some noodles around it so it's nice and crunchy. The crispy um, prawn beetle leaf in tapioca is also still on the menu. Um, we've got some, you know, the duck curry, Coda's duck curry, mm. um, is still, you know, on the menu and still one of the most most loved dishes, which, you know. I got found inspiration from when you know my time at Pearl and time at Long Grain, and then made made my own version of it. Um, so that's been, you know, I guess I guess one of, next to the crispy prawn beetle leaves, the duck curry has to be one of the most successful or most loved most loved dishes of Coda. Mm. You spent your career um, cooking Italian and modern Asian and Thai, and creating your own restaurant, and then Tonka came along and a chance to uh, dive into your Indian heritage. Um, Tell us about that restaurant and what it was like pulling a modern interpretation of Indian together. Well, the way way Tonka was born was actually um, my business partner, Michael, and I were kept on joking about we should open a modern Indian restaurant and call it Get It India. (laughs) 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 And uh, the the joke turned to reality. Um, when another site came up in the in the in the building that house housed honky tonks, <laughs> a, a, a very um, famous nightclub, which would have been uh, maybe your era as well, but back in the um, late nineties, early you know noughties, um, and and um, so pretty much had yeah. We thought well let's let's do Indian, but uh, not Indian. Let's make it modern and because as go, referring back to my mother having to make curry every day for my for my dad and that we never used she never used ghee in her cooking. So it was mm. always light the curries were always light and, and um, <clears throat> light and tasty. And so that's I took the I took that same principle to um, Tonka and we don't use ghee. The only time we use ghee or butter is actually now in the butter chicken and we use some ghee to, to brush the naan. Mm. So um, and then, then I had some great some great um, chefs um, work work with me, um, Indian chefs who had brought also a lot of their kind of guess family recipes, and we just interpreted it in a in a in a in a in a nice way, using you know the produce of Australia that as we do, and and just kind of just mon- like just making it a bit more, not not so much sort of delicate, but it just just a bit more prettier or just a bit more restauranty and not stodgy. 
because it was a very hard sell when we opened up Tonka, trying to get um, our Coda customers to come. Mm-hmm. You know, they'd ring up and the, and the, and the, and the people go, oh, it's Indian. Oh, isn't it heavy and stodgy? And we're like, no, it's not because it's ghee-free. And once they came and actually tasted it, they were like, oh, wow, this is um, a bit different. So, you know, same modern Indian kind of – I don't think we're modern Indian because we're still using like classic – classic recipes or traditional recipes, but just kind of just presented in, in a different way mm. also. So I mean, we don't trick the food up like a lot of, um, I guess, modern Indian restaurants do in India that I've experienced um, and some that are in Australia. But it's, it's just, it's just, look, it's just a, good, a place where, you know, there's staples on the menu. There's a lamb curry. There's a butter chicken. You know, there's stuff. There's ocean trout from the tandoori oven. Just really just simple but tasty food that people mm. like. And then we have a beautiful array of wines and, and believe it or not, Italian wines, So, which uh, match well with Indian food. Tonka and, and Coda are two of the most successful restaurants in Melbourne over the last decade. What, what makes a successful restaurant from your perspective? Consistency. Consistency makes a successful restaurant because you want the food to always be the same. You want the service to be the same. But there's also just, you know, that's, I think the concept and what people want and I think what we've created there is timeless food. It's not, we don't, we never, I'm, I've never followed a fad. You know, one mm. thing that Jeff taught me was always stay, stay true to the culture and um, heritage of that cuisine, you know, it's existed for that many years that, you know, put your little spin on it, but don't try and deviate from what the, the true essence of that, of that cuisine is. So, in, sorry, go. In Melbourne, you've uh, experienced five lockdowns at the moment. What, what sort of impact has that had on you and have the businesses changed as a result of that? Uh, lockdown number five. Look, they become they all they all they're all just blend into one. Doesn't it just doesn't uh, doesn't. <laughs> you could tell me lockdown fifty and be like, yeah, 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 cool, same, same. And so you know, we we the thing is, we pivoted back in March, twenty twenty straight away. Um, my head chef Kayleen Tan, who and executive page chef Kayleen Tan, um, you know, the next day she said, chef, I think we should just package all our cur- all our curries up and everything and start selling them. And I went, great idea. So she was the integral part to that, Hmm. turning that around. And we started, you know, selling through grocers um, like Toscano's and um, Boccaccio sellers. Um, And that's why now we've got about 30-odd retailers. And so that's where we just sold sold, sold our product. And that allowed us to keep keep the lights on, keep all the chefs, you know, even our visa holders employed and all our full-time staff employed also. So... That has been um, that was that was the pivotal moment, and that's kind of kept us. You know, now we created we created another business out of it, which we which we still have continued through um, when we've gone back to normal normal trading. One of the real successes that you've had in the last year and a half, as well, is the creation of Boca Gelato. Is that something that you'd been thinking of doing for years, or has it been a response to the current situation? Um, it was it was born actually born out of COVID. Uh, last August, when um, my gelati chef and business partner in Boca Gelato, Monica, um, we were at, long story short, we had, we're having a chat because Kayleen asked us to go check out some some guy's place who wanted to do gelati and um, sandwiches. And Monica came down. We met down da- down there to see if the space was big enough. And she goes, "No, you can't make gelati out of this because Monica was doing. You know, she'd been working at Pic- Piccolina and Gelato Papa in um, Melbourne here." And I, and a long story short, I said, "Why don't we just do our own gelati shop?" She goes, "Yeah, why not?" I said, <laughs> "So Monica, who um, also started as an apprentice at Coda and Tonka seven years ago." So, wow. Um, and then that, that that was the rest of its history, and I already had the name Bocca from wanting to do an Italian restaurant about three years ago, which never came to fruition. So I always wanted to go back to my Italian side, and I said, "Well, I've got the name and the branding called Bocca. Why don't we just add gelato to the end of it?" And um, yeah, the, we found a spot in Ivanhoe, which is um, my local suburb, and did a deal during COVID, and uh, we opened up in April 2021. What's the secret to great gelato? The, that's, a, that's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's all made naturally. It's all made naturally. We don't use any um, artificial powders like some other um, – ice creameries do or gelati places do so keeping it 
keeping it real. You've, uh, you just briefly mentioned that a couple of years ago you thought about veering back into your Italian heritage. Heritage Is that something that you might do in the future with a restaurant? Uh, I may do that in the future, but I think maybe keeping it very simple, like either a pizza shop um, uh, or pizza restaurant or just a, you know pizza and pasta, but even just pizza because I do think there's, there's just one kind of um, burning desire mm. to actually do go back to where it all started from, mm. you know, making pizzas. And, um, you know, just like gelati, I think they seem like they're pretty COVID-proof businesses, hence why I, I, I kind of like diversified into that. You're also the culinary director at the W Hotel. What does it take to uh, create something for – um, a venue that has so many different outlets like um, room service or restaurants? Um, well, the, 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 what's, having said that, the W was um, the reason why I put my um, Italian restaurant on, the ho- on hold because mm. they approached me. I mean, the Marriott group had always been talking to me um, over the years, doing wanting to uh, do go into certain different different restaurants of theirs. So the Marriott, Marriott Bonvoy is obviously a massive um, company with lots of um, different um, – a massive umbrella – and there's lots of different hotels underneath it. So when they asked me that, I thought W's, W's on, on brand for me. And I said, no problem. Let's go. And obviously COVID hit and that, and there was a bit of a building delay with the construction of it. But then we, we finally got there and opened in February. And uh, I guess that, you know, the challenges are, is this, you know, you got to still be international, but you also got to be relevant. And that's what I, you know, I said, I've, and I've brought to the W Melbourne is I guess my eclectic, uh, cuisine, uh, mm. cooking, cooking style, and what, and I think I, you know, pretty much my my food define defines Melbourne. So you know, when the internationals came in, they would get to be getting a taste of what Melbourne is, being quite eclectic. Well, can you give us a sense of what that is? Well, I guess it's similar to what I created at Coda, but I've got to got I've got to be able to I've got to be able to put a bit more Italian into the menu, mm. which is good. Um, you know, I've got a, 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 I guess the, the hit dish of Lolo at the W, which is the which is a flagship restaurant. There is my duck lasagna. So wow, making that's what I thought. You know, cooked to water, like it's like a rotolo style with the you know kind of duck duck mm. duck bolognese base, and um, baked in the in the pizza oven there with more buffalo mozzarella, and um, yeah, it's it's a hit. I thought I wanted because I wanted to actually elevate. That, the lasagna and do it in some sort of way so yeah that's how it kind of came about and it's um it's been a hit ever since with your fingers in so many successful pies in in melbourne what is it that you love about what you do now um uh, with my finger in so many different pies i mean i love the diversity of it i love the gelati aspect of it i love you know working back in a hotel with um with a team of those, with the team there and then even the restaurants i just think it's kind of yeah, it keeps me busy, and I kind of like just just like the the variety, um, and it's constantly evolving. You know, I've just started getting into into more TV. With just finished filming um, a cooking show called India Unplated, uh, wow! So, which is going to be on the SBS. So, so that's I guess it's a version of Asia Unplated. So we we filmed that, which is great. So yeah, just kind of just. Taking, taking what you can and just making the most of every opportunity, as I always have. Well, in the last year and a half, you've turned uh, a lot of the adversity into positives, whether it be Tonka or the creation of Boca Gelato. Um, what, what's the positives to come out of the last year and a half for you uh, personally as we move forward? Uh, well, I think I guess, I mean, I'm just always just a positive person. You know, I could have wake up even during the, the, the lockdown or, you know, the restaurant's getting shut down. Is that you always got to look at the, the, the things where you can make, make another opportunity out of, you know, always mm. look at, there's always, an op- there's always something to be made out of it. And, you know, I mean, that's what, you know, Gelati was born out of COVID. The W was there and we finally got open and then just being able to, you know, make the restaurant survive um, as well. I think there's, I mean, a lot of positive because I think it's just uh, now going, just going into the next level, just, just starting to hit hit my strides in the sense of with what's going on. So, well, Adam, we've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds to hear your story today. Um, good luck with the new initiatives that you have, and and no doubt we'll hear of something new pretty soon as well. Uh, please keep in touch, and we'll catch up again soon. No worries. Cheers. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. 
stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.